There you go. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome again. This is our first community chat from 2023. So I hope it's not too late to wish you a happy new year to those of you who follow us in the community chats. Today, we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic, actually, and especially I find it interesting as a dietitian. Of course, I find it interesting. There is a lot that we hear about gluten and how many food choices now are like gluten free. We see it at supermarkets, we see it in menus, in restaurants, and a lot of people are like becoming gluten free. Now, should I go gluten-free is the topic for today because we are going to learn today if it's really necessary or when it is necessary. Same as other food intolerances, food allergies, food sensitivities. And we have an expert today to talk to us about all of this. All we know is that sometimes we feel this continuous discomfort and we don't know where it's coming from. So hopefully after today, we can find out more about it. And maybe, you know, who knows, we can start resolving it. So Shari Kitts, she, and did I say your name correctly? Yes. Perfect. So uh, she's a registered dietitian and she is a specialist in all these food sensitivities, GI, issues and all of that so it's such a pleasure to have her with us today because honestly I have never met a dietitian and I think I shared this with Shari before I never met a dietitian who specialized on this and she's definitely a specialist and she knows what she's doing but she's going to tell us more about what she does so Shari do you want to tell us a little bit of what you do yeah thank you Sandra for that wonderful introduction um my name is Shari Keats I am a registered dietitian nutritionist with a virtual private practice um, here in New York State. I also am licensed to practice in Connecticut, as well as working with a concierge physician in New York City. I specialize in celiac disease and gluten intolerances, as well as being um, certified in low FODMAP via the Monash University diet. So I really enjoy helping people figure out what's going on with their GI because food is so intertwined with what's going on with our gastrointestinal systems. So I really enjoy doing that. Yeah, that's that's great. So I can't wait. So um, you probably know how this works and I'm talking to our attendees. Please ask questions. We're supposed to, you know, we're offering this space so that you can ask all the questions you like. It's not every day that we can actually talk to a real specialist and have our questions answered. So use the chat. Use the Q&A, type all your questions. I'm going to read them to Shari. She's going to have a presentation in the beginning, and then we're going to do the Q&A at the end, okay? So uh, please take advantage, and Shari, you can get us started. Great. So like Sandra said, today we're going to find out whether or not you should be going gluten-free. Um, I just want to put it out there. I have nothing to disclose. But I also wanna make sure that this presentation is meant to not meant to take the place of any recommendation from your healthcare provider. So if you have a specific question related to your exact healthcare needs, please reach out to them. You know, I don't wanna replace any medical advice that you might be getting from them. So the objectives today are, why do people go gluten-free? What is gluten and where is it found? We're gonna go into gluten-free nutrition as well as how to read a gluten-free label, how to set up a safe gluten-free kitchen. And at the end, I have some gluten-free resources that are very helpful for you. So let's start off with first, why people go gluten-free. There are various reasons. There are medical conditions, and we're gonna go over these, um, starting off with celiac disease, a condition called dermatitis herpetiformis, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, wheat allergy, as well as personal preferences. And we're gonna spend some time talking about what else could be going on that makes you feel better when you go gluten-free. So let's start off with celiac disease. This is an autoimmune disease. This means your body has an immune response to gluten, which is a protein found in wheat, rye, and barley. When gluten is eaten, 
the body attacks the small intestine, leading to damage of the villi, the small finger-like projections that line the small intestine and absorb nutrients. And you can see them here. Here's the um, stomach, food goes into the small intestine, and these little villi line it. And in someone with celiac disease, when the villi are damaged, they can't properly function. And they're what we call blunted. And this leads to malabsorption, decreased vitamin and mineral intake. And lastly, the immune, the immune response may also lead to damage in other parts of the body, such as skin, bones, and the nervous system. Immune responses aren't just localized in the gut. They can happen all throughout the body as well. Celiac disease affects over 3 million people in the United States, about one in 100 people in the general population, but over 80% go undiagnosed. So if someone, if your family has celiac disease, the probability of you developing it increases significantly. And what's really important here is celiac disease can develop at any age. I have clients who are four years old, and I have clients who are newly diagnosed at 60. And I've even seen in clinics someone diagnosed at 80. So it's really important to um, be aware of what these symptoms are and talk to your healthcare provider about it. And the other important thing to know is celiac disease affects individuals of all ethnicities. And one of the reasons that celiac disease goes undiagnosed is that there are over 200 symptoms and they can vary widely. There's no such thing as a typical case. Many people do not experience any of the gastric symptoms that were previously thought to be associated with the disease. And then there's something called silent celiac disease. And here there are no symptoms. And it's often found when screening high risk groups such as first degree relatives, and individuals with type one diabetes. And so here are some of the symptoms that you'll see with celiac disease. For gastrointestinal, there could be diarrhea, fatty stools, constipation, cramps, bloating, flatulence or gas, lactose intolerance, acid reflux, nausea or vomiting. For non-gastrointestinal, there can be headaches, fatigue, depression, joint pain, muscle aches and cramps, peripheral neuropathies, infertility, menstrual irregularities, and dental abnormalities. And lastly, because we have this deficiency or this damage to the intestine, there's malabsorption. So you might see anemia or iron deficiency on a blood test, as well as vitamin and mineral deficiencies, in particular, iron, folic acid, vitamins B6 and B12, vitamin D, zinc, and copper. Calcium malabsorption can occur, and with that, osteopenia and osteoporosis. There can be weight loss, and very often in children, we see something called failure to thrive. So in small children, if they're not growing along what their expected growth curve is, that's when we would look to see if the celiac disease could be a cause. So how do we test? First, you need to have a thorough physical examination with a complete medical history and blood work that includes a celiac panel. And this will measure the amount of particular antibodies in the blood. And this is what your immune system is creating, these antibodies. And the most common tests include something called TTG or tissue transglutaminase antibody and total serum IgA or an immunoglobin A antibody. Other available tests include endomesial antibody and deaminated gliadin peptide, IgA, and IgG. Your gastroenterologist will also perform an upper endoscopy and take several biopsies of the small intestine, especially a part including the part called the duodenum, which is at the upper part of the small intestine, so that they can see that damage to the villi that I was talking about. But what's really important to know in testing for celiac disease, you must be consuming gluten throughout the entire testing process. Failure to do so can lead to a false negative or an inconclusive result. And other serious medical conditions look similar to celiac disease. 
including Crohn's and colitis. So those need to be ruled out. And it's important to go through the testing to get this accurate diagnosis. Keeping to a lifelong strict gluten-free diet can be burdensome. And it's more difficult to maintain without proven medical need. There's no reason to be following a gluten-free diet strictly if you don't have celiac. Once you are diagnosed with celiac disease and the gluten-free diet has started, your antibody levels should start to drop and your villi should start to heal. Unfortunately, the only medical management, I'm sorry, there is no medical management for the disease. The only effective treatment is this lifelong adherence to a gluten-free diet. Some people will see on the internet digestive enzymes and supplements. These cannot be used to treat celiac. It is also recommended that once you get this diagnosis that you see a registered dietitian nutritionist like myself, who's trained in celiac disease to get you started on the gluten-free diet. And some people may need treatment for vitamin and mineral deficiencies, and that should be done under the supervision of a healthcare professional. So how do we screen family members? Because that's important. First degree relatives, parents, child, or sibling of someone who has celiac should get tested. The easiest way to do this is blood testing or the celiac panel for the presence of the antibodies to see if you have elevated TTG. Genetic testing can also be done for the associated genes HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8. But genetic testing can only rule out celiac disease. It does not detect the disease. But if you don't have the gene, in all likelihood, you can't get celiac disease. And less than 5% of the people with celiac-related genes will develop celiac disease. There's another condition called dermatitis herpetiformis. And this is a patchy, itchy skin rash with small little blisters that's associated with celiac disease. It's often found, found bilaterally. And what that means, it'll be on both sides of either your elbows, knees, buttocks, and scalp. And in most cases, the small intestine of someone who has dermatitis herpetiformis is also being damaged by gluten ingestion. DH is more common in men than women. It's diagnosed this time though by a skin biopsy by a dermato dermatologist. And treatment for this disease as well is lifelong adherence to a strict gluten-free diet, but it may also include some medications to manage the symptoms of the itching and the rash. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity is also something that you might hear about. And this is an intolerance to gluten ingestion. And while symptoms are similar to those with celiac disease, there is minimal to no damage to the intestinal villi. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity affects about 6% of the population. And currently there's no test to diagnose this. A diagnosis can only really be made after celiac disease and wheat allergy, which we're gonna discuss in a moment, have been ruled out. And el eliminating gluten again here is the only treatment. Many of the symptoms of non-celiac gluten sensitivity are very similar to those seen in celiac disease. Again, most of the symptoms are gastrointestinal, but there may be extra intestinal symptoms as well. And these symptoms include diarrhea, fatigue, bloating, stomach ache, nausea, gas, constipation, headache, joint and muscle pain, as well as confusion. So wheat allergy is something different. This is an allergic immune reaction to wheat ingestion. It involves a different branch of the immune system than celiac disease. It may include a reaction in your skin, mouth, lungs, and or the GI tract. Wheat allergy should this time be diagnosed by an allergist. And what's interesting to know here is that most children with a wheat allergy will outgrow it by the age of about six. And only about half a percent of American adults are affected by it. So just to go back to some of those percentages, 1% of the population will have celiac disease, 6% non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and less than 1% wheat allergy in this country. So what are the symptoms of wheat allergy? 
They can be very similar to gluten intolerance, but they may also include more classic allergic symptoms. So in addition to stomach cramps, nausea, vomiting, headache, you might also see nasal congestion, skin rash, difficulty breathing, and in extreme situations, anaphylaxis. So how do we test? As with other, as with other allergies, your doctor may use a skin prick test or blood test to identify if you have a wheat allergy. The doctor may also try eliminating wheat from your diet to determine if there's a significant change in your symptoms. An oral food challenge, which is a test in which the allergist will feed you wheat in measured doses may also be conducted. But this type of test should only be done at a medical facility so that you are surrounded by the appropriate medications and equipment in case a severe reaction occurs. The treatment of wheat allergy involves avoiding products containing wheat, and this is different. There's no need to follow a strict gluten-free diet. So other gluten-containing grains, such as barley and rye, should not trigger symptoms. Although their relatives of wheat like spelt, camet, and chikatale may. So your doctor may also suggest medications such as antihistamines and epinephrine to manage your wheat allergy symptoms. But could this be something else? Often there are other reasons you may experience relief from gastrointestinal symptoms when starting a gluten-free diet that are not related to gluten. And these include something called irritable bowel syndrome, a sensitivity to FODMAPs, an allergy to a protein other than gluten, and maybe your diet is higher in more unprocessed foods when you go on the gluten-free diet. So let's dive into these a little bit more. For irritable bowel syndrome, many people, foods with high levels of insoluble fiber will trigger diarrhea, cramping, or an urgent need to use the bathroom. And gluten-containing whole wheat foods, like certain breads, crackers, shredded wheat cereals, bran flakes, or bran-based crisp breads, are really high in insoluble fiber. So when people with IBS eliminate these, they often feel better without these whole wheat foods. It lowers the levels of insoluble fiber, and they often attribute this to removing gluten. But in reality, you're feeling better because you've lowered your fiber intake. And this is something that we're hearing a lot about these days, and these are called FODMAPs. And what these mean is fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. There are a group of sugars that we are unable to completely digest or absorb in our intestines. As they pass through the digestive system, these FODMAPs move very slowly. And because of that, they attract water and they're fermented by gut bacteria, causing gas and bloating in the large intestine. And this extra gas and bloating and water can cause abdominal pain and discomfort. Recent research suggests that the majority of people who experience digestive distress associated with wheat are actually reacting to one of the carbohydrates in the wheat called a fructan, which is one of these FODMAPs, not the gluten. In general, carbohydrates like fructans are beneficial. They feed and nourish certain populations of gut bacteria that are associated with many health benefits. So you want to know what your sensitivity is here. Working with your healthcare professional and your registered dietitian nutritionist, you can discover if you have this sensitivity to fructans. You first need to rule out celiac disease or any other medical conditions before moving on to this. But if you're still experiencing distress, it's important to find out what's going on. If this is the case also, there's no need to follow the gluten-free diet. You may just need to lower your fructan index and there's also on the market now digestive enzymes that can help you with fructan digestion. And some gluten-containing foods are low in fructans, including a wheat-based sourdough bread and often spelt bread. And what's also nice is for people who just have this sensitivity, regular oats and soy sauce don't contain fructans either, so these are foods that you can be eating. 
Another thing though that does need to be diagnosed by a medical professional is an allergy to proteins other than gluten in the wheat. So besides wheat allergies, some people have a lesser known allergic type condition that's called eosinophilic esophagitis or EOE. This reaction can also be triggered by wheat and it affects only roughly the same amount of US adults as wheat allergies, about less than 1%. EOE results in an abnormal accumulation of what we call inflammatory white blood cells or eosinophils. And they're going to, this is the esophagus here, and they're gonna accumulate. And this can lead to heartburn or reflux type symptoms and a swelling to the point of food getting stuck while swallowing. So here you have these eosinophils and they're constricting the esophagus. The majority of EOE cases have one or more food triggers, and wheat is at the top of these triggers. Milk protein is the other. EOE should be diagnosed by a physician, and an experienced registered dietitian nutritionist can help you determine your food triggers. Like wheat allergy, people with EOE don't have to follow a strict gluten-free diet, but they do have to follow a strict wheat-free diet. And lastly, maybe your diet is higher in more whole uh, unprocessed foods. By following a gluten-free diet, most people reduce the consumption of many of the breads, pastas, and desserts that they eat, whether at home or while dining out. And for some people, this results in an overall healthier diet pattern, containing more vegetables and salads, reducing the amount of blood sugar spiking refined carbohydrates in the diet. So many people report improved energy, less hunger, and even some weight loss and attribute the changes to the removal of gluten. However, it's more likely that the less processed whole food diet is leading to a better quality of life for you. So now we're gonna go into what is gluten and where is it found? So as I said, gluten is a protein. Food is comprised of three different macronutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, and fat. So gluten is the protein found in wheat, in that case it's called gliadin, in barley or hordain, and rye, cecalin. And gluten is what gives elasticity to do a dough. It helps it rise and keep its shape, and it also gives baked goods that chewy texture. So there are many gluten-containing grains and derivatives. So these are things that you need to be looking out for if you are avoiding gluten. So on a label, in addition to wheat, you're looking for bulgur, couscous, durum, icorn wheat, emmer, farina, farro, gram, kamut, semolina, spelt, chikatale, and wheat berries. And barley, in addition to barley itself, is also processed, is often processed into malt. And in various forms, such as malted barley flour, malted milk or milk shakes, malt extract, malt syrup, malt flavoring, and malt vinegar. And barley is also used to make brewer's yeast. And lastly, you're looking for rye or sakali. These are all the gluten-containing grains and their derivatives. So there are certain foods that may contain gluten that you might not be aware of. So you wanna be sure to check the labels for gluten in these items. Brown rice syrup and French fries and fried foods. In restaurants, they're often cooked in a shared fryer. Imitation bacon may contain gluten. Imitation seafood, often found as imitation crab and sushi. A lot of processed foods, seasonings and spice mixes. Although individual dried herbs and spices are okay, smoke flavoring, soups and soup bases, especially a cream soup that might be thickened with a flour. Soy sauces most often contain wheat. So in that case, you might wanna look for something called tamari, which does not contain wheat. And then there might be something called a yeast extract or an autolyzed yeast extract. And here you might need to contact a manufacturer to see where that yeast extract came from 
Was it derived from one of those gluten containing grains that we discussed? And then there are some non-food sources of gluten, um, some hair products, soaps, lotions, cosmetics, arts and crafts materials, in particular Play-Doh. And this is not a concern for celiac or gluten sensitivity unless the product is ingested. I mean, I've seen some people say to me, well, I put this lotion on my hand and it, you know, I, all of a sudden my stomach bothered me. That's not how the gluten is being absorbed through your skin. Really what's happening is if you are sucking on your hand or you somehow or other like with your lipstick tend to get it ingested. So for small children, gluten-free products might be the way to go. And for some people, a gluten-free um, lip balm is something that they're interested in. And there are plenty of products on the market that follow this. Next, we're gonna talk about gluten-free nutrition. What can you eat? And there are many nutritious and delicious foods to choose from that are naturally gluten-free. Fruits and vegetables, meat and poultry, fish and seafood, beans and legumes, nuts and seeds, dairy and eggs. And that's a lot of stuff. And when I'm talking to my clients, I wanna make sure that they're creating healthy plates and healthy meals because this is important. And I usually use with them my plate. This was developed by the US Department of Agriculture and it's based on the current dietary guidelines for good overall nutrition. There's a focus on a variety of fruits and vegetables, and here we're gonna say gluten-free grains, proteins, and dairy or fortified plant milk-based alternatives at meals. So first we're gonna start with vegetables. So half your plate should be colorful, non-starchy vegetables and fruits. These non-starchy vegetables can be raw or cooked, fresh, frozen, canned, dried or dehydrated. They can be whole, cut up or pureed. It's important to choose a lot of colors. I love red, orange, and dark green vegetables. If you're buying canned, make sure to look for containers that are marked low sodium. And I also like to point out that fresh and frozen are equally good, especially at this time of year when so many vegetables um, are not available in the market. Frozen without sauce vegetables are great alternatives. And for these, you wanna have at least two and a half cups per day of these non-starchy vegetables. Fruit should be that other part of your plate. And these can be fresh, canned, frozen, or dried, and they can also be whole, cut up, or pureed. But here, if you're canned, you're looking for containers without added sugar. Again, fresh and frozen are equally good but you wanna avoid sweetened juices, anything canned in syrup, and especially sweetened dried fruits. And with fruits, we wanna aim for no more than two cups per day. Proteins should be one quarter of your plate, and these should be lean proteins. And animal proteins include things like fish, poultry, meat, and dairy. You wanna limit red meat and cheese, you want to avoid bacon, cold cuts, and other processed meats, and you want to aim for fish twice a week. Portion size for animal proteins are about three to five ounces or about the size of your fist. It's a great little way of, you know, having this in your back pocket all the time. Plant-based proteins include nuts, seeds, and legumes. They're high in fiber, and they're a great source of vitamins and minerals. And portion size for beans and legumes are about a half a cup. Nuts and seeds are a quarter of a cup. I do want to point out that for many of these nuts and for, I'm sorry, for many of these legumes and beans, it's important to rinse and go through them for any sort of errant grain that might be um, there from the processing of these materials. So one quarter of your plate should either be a gluten-free grain or a starchy vegetable. And in the list below, I've marked some with a star, and those are going to be more nutritious, and they're going to be higher in fiber and more with more nutrients. And in some of these later slides, we're going to talk about what some of these items are and how you can prepare them. So you have amaranth, arrowroot, beans, buckwheat groats, which is also known as kasha, cassava, 
chia, corn, flax, gluten-free oats, which is important, millet, nut flours, potato flour, I'm sorry, potato, quinoa, rice, sorghum, soy, tapioca, teff, and yuca. And you wanna read the labels carefully. All flours made with these grains and starches should be labeled gluten-free. So now we're gonna talk oats. And oats are often harvested and processed on the same equipment that is used for wheat, and therefore they are easily contaminated. But research indicates that pure, uncontaminated oats consumed in moderation, which is about a half cup dry rolled oats daily, are tolerated by most people with celiac. However, some people with celiac disease have an immune reaction to the avenin in the oats. And this is a protein similar to gluten. And so they should avoid all oats, even those labeled gluten-free. So therefore, when newly diagnosed, you should really be symptom-free and check with your celiac disease healthcare provider before introducing oats into the diet. If you get the okay and you can tolerate the oats, be sure they're specifically labeled purity protocol certified gluten-free oats. And this includes things like granolas and granola bars. So now we're gonna talk about how to cook with some of these alternative grains. Buckwheat, it really is okay. It's just the name. It's actually related to rhubarb and sorrel. It's rich in protein, dietary fiber, B vitamins, and the dietary minerals, iron, manganese, phosphorus, magnesium, zinc, and copper. And I just wanna reiterate that these were some of the vitamins and minerals that we talked about your body might have difficulty absorbing and you might have deficiencies in when newly diagnosed with celiac. So it's important to be getting these, trying these alternative grains. Buckwheat has a mild nutty taste. It can be used in soups, hot cereal, pasta dishes. To prepare it, toast the buckwheat first. It's gonna enhance its flavor. And you can cook one cup of buckwheat with two cups of any liquid for about 10 to 15 minutes, remove from the heat and drain any excess liquid. Millet is one of my favorites. It's rich in protein, again, dietary fiber, B vitamins, and the dietary minerals, manganese, phosphorus, and magnesium. This has a mild sweet corn-like flavor. So you can use this as a warm side dish. It's also great in salads. And it's also good as a porridge for breakfast. So again, to prepare this, toast it first to enhance its flavor. And so for a fluffy texture, cook one cup of millet with two cups of liquid for 20 minutes. For a creamy porridge, cook one cup of millet with three cups of liquid for 25 minutes. Next, we're gonna talk about quinoa. A lot of people have heard about this. Again, rich in protein, dietary fiber, B vitamins, and the dietary minerals, iron, magnesium, phosphorus, and magnesium, I'm sorry, and manganese. It also has a nutty flavor, and it's a great alternative to white rice. So use it as a side dish or in salads. It can also be used as a porridge for breakfast. I like to make quinoa at the beginning of the week and then just store it in my refrigerator and scoop out cups to be adding to different dishes. To prepare this, rinse it well before cooking in a fine mesh strainer, that's important. You wanna cook one cup of quinoa with two cups of liquid for about 20 minutes, remove it from the heat and let it steam for five minutes. And lastly, we have something called sorghum. It's rich in protein, dietary fiber, B vitamins, and the dietary minerals, iron, phosphorus, and potassium. This also has a mild flavor and a chewy texture. It's a great alternative to couscous. You can use it in soups and with baking, there are many flour forms of sorghum, and it can also be popped like popcorn. Instead of a big kernel like corn, you get little itty bitty sorghum pops. So toast your sorghum first to enhance its flavor. Cook one cup of sorghum with three cups of liquid for about 50 to 60 minutes and remove it from the heat and let it steam for five minutes. Now we're gonna talk about dairy and plant-based milks. If dairy is consumed, it's important to opt for fat-free or low-fat products, which provide the same amount of calcium and other essential nutrients as whole milk products, but with less fat and calories. Nut, 
oat and soy milks are good alternatives, but read the labels to ensure the milk, plant milks are fortified with calcium and are low in added sugar and sodium. With oat milk products, make sure they are certified gluten-free. That is really important. And here, a serving size of milk is eight ounces. So is the gluten-free diet healthier? Not necessarily, even though many athletes and celebrities believe it is. If you go gluten-free without a medical reason, you risk inadequate, I'm sorry, inaccurate blood tests for celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity if you need to be tested later. Also the possibility of lower fiber intake, which is necessary for healthy digestion. Many of the gluten-free breads on the market are very low in fiber. You also will risk vitamin and mineral deficiencies because gluten-free products aren't required to be enriched like gluten-containing products are. Gluten-containing grains are enriched with essential nutrients like B vitamins and iron, and you will not find these in the gluten-free products. In addition, there is no evidence that eating gluten will trigger celiac disease in people without a family history of it. What about alcohol? Even though it's dry January, we're gonna talk about this. Distilled spirits, even if they're made from wheat, barley, or rye, are considered gluten-free. The distillation process removes the gluten protein. This includes bourbon, whiskey, tequila, gin, vodka, and rum. But you should check for the hidden gluten in any liquor, liquors that add flavorings or other additives after distillation. Hard ciders are made from fermented fruit juices and are often gluten-free. However, some ciders use barley, so be sure to read those labels carefully. And for mixers, spike seltzers, wine coolers, and hard lemonades, these may be gluten-free, but the ingredients vary and they change often. So check the labels carefully, in particular for barley and barley malt. For beer, there are two types of gluten-free beers on the market. The first is made from gluten-free grains, typically sorghum and millet, and these are safe to drink. They'll be labeled gluten-free, and brands are include Anheuser-Busch Redbridge and something called Glutenberg. The second type of beer is made from barley and wheat, and the gluten is removed during processing. These are not safe for people with celiac disease, wheat allergies, or non-celiac gluten sensitivity. They are often labeled gluten removed or gluten reduced. And these brands include Omission and Stone Delicious IPA. So how do we read a gluten-free label? Since 2014, the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration has issued rules for gluten-free labeling that are voluntary for manufacturers. In order for a product to make a gluten-free claim on the packaging, it must contain less than 20 parts per million of gluten. This is the level that it can low this I'm sorry this is the lowest level that can be reliably detected in foods using scientifically validated testing methods. Most people with celiac disease can tolerate foods with this very 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 small amount of gluten. So the FDA regulation replies to all FDA regulated foods and beverages and that includes packaged foods, fruits and vegetables, shell eggs and fish, dietary supplements like vitamins, minerals, herbs, and amino acids, and imported food products that are subject to these FDA regulations. It does not cover meat, poultry, and certain egg products like egg beaters that are found in the carton. These are regulated by the US Department of Agriculture and are naturally gluten-free when unprocessed. As well as most alcoholic beverages not being covered, these are regulated by the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau of the US Department of Treasury. So for a food product to be labeled gluten-free, it does not contain wheat, barley, or rye or it does not contain an ingredient derived from these gluten-containing grains that has not been processed to remove gluten, 
So you might see something called wheat starch. In that case, it's been processed to remove the gluten. If it's labeled gluten-free and it says wheat starch, it is safe. Or they do not contain an ingredient derived from, I'm sorry, here's where the wheat starch is. They do not contain an ingredient derived from a gluten-containing grain that has not been processed to remove gluten if it results in 20 parts per million of gluten or more. So you wanna make sure that when you're leading a label, if it says gluten-free, it falls into one of these three categories. Products that are naturally gluten-free, like fruits and vegetables, can be labeled gluten-free. There's no standard. There's also no standard symbol that the FDA uses for something being labeled by gluten-free. Manufacturers can use the words gluten-free or any symbol they want, as long as it's truthful. But the FDA does not require manufacturers to test products labeled gluten-free. They must simply ensure that the labeling requirements are met. So it's at the onus falls on the manufacturers to make sure that their products are safe when they are labeled gluten-free. In 2004, the FDA came out with the Food Allergen Label and Consumer Protection Act called FALPA. And this identified eight foods or food groups as major food allergens. They're milk, eggs, fish, shellfish, tree nuts, peanuts, wheat, and soybeans. And as of January, 2023, sesame was added to this list. FALPA requires that a label declare the presence of any of these nine allergens. Therefore, if a package says contains wheat, it will not be safe. However, it's important to note that barley and rye are not on this list of allergens. So a product may be wheat-free, but not gluten-free if barley and rye are in the ingredient list. So let's take a look at a food label. Always starts with the nutrition facts, then we have the ingredient statement. And then down here, you always have the allergen statement. If it is not labeled gluten-free on the packaging, read this ingredient label thoroughly. Check for obvious or questionable ingredients such as wheat, barley, rye, malt, brewer's yeast, and oats, unless specifically labeled gluten-free. Also check the allergen statement found after the ingredient statement for wheat. This product says contains wheat, so then it would not be safe for someone with celiac, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, or a wheat allergy. Some organizations provide third-party certifications, and these are separate from the FDA. These certifications are meant to provide independent verification of the strict gluten-free standards. And each of these groups has its own tests and standards for the level of trace gluten that they will allow, but all are at or below the 20 parts per million as regulated by the FDA. So we have something called Beyond Celiac. This is the Gluten Intolerance Group or GFCO, NSF, which is a big national testing organization. And this is the National Celiac Association's certified gluten-free symbol. Over-the-counter medications must follow the FDA labeling rules. Prescription medications, though, are not required to disclose allergens, so inactive ingredients should be checked for gluten content. Your pharmacist should be able to assist you. Each new prescription or refill should be reevaluated. Ingredients do change. There are also websites that are reliable sources for this information. And lastly, how do we have a safe gluten-free kitchen? First off, does the kitchen need to be completely gluten-free? It's important to avoid cross-contact and cross-contamination. And this occurs when gluten items come into contact with gluten, I'm sorry, when gluten-free items come into contact with gluten-containing items. But it's also important to avoid being overly restricted because you wanna maintain an adequate quality of life. In the home, kitchen equipment and utensils used for gluten-containing food may not pose such a high risk for those with celiac disease as the actual wheat flour and breadcrumbs do. So cross-contamination during the preparation of food or cooking should be avoided by cleaning utensils. It's very easy just with soap and water or in the dishwasher and making sure that you're washing your hands and surfaces regularly. 
and it should be the decision made with your family or housemates on how to best set up this kitchen and whether it will be completely gluten-free or if it will be a shared space with spaces for gluten-free foods. So if it is a shared space, in your cupboard and pantries, always store gluten-free items above the gluten-containing items. Store all gluten-free products in labeled containers. If possible, gluten-free items should have a dedicated space in the pantry. For cooking equipment, strainers, wooden and plastic cutting boards, wooden spoons, metal and plastic utensils can be used with both gluten-containing and gluten-free foods provided they've been thoroughly washed between uses. At one point, there was a lot of discussion that these things needed to be gluten-free pots and pans for your gluten-containing pots and pans. There's been studies that show that does not need to be the case. If you have a food processor or a waffle iron, make sure they're thoroughly washed between uses, but do use a separate air fryer and bread, make for gl bread maker for gluten-free and gluten-containing foods. In cooking methods, always use separate cooking water for your gluten-free and gluten-containing items. For example, pasta water. You can cook your gluten-free pasta in the water, take it out, then put in your gluten-containing pasta. The same with frying. Start with the gluten-free oil and then put in the gluten-containing item. For condiments and spreads, squeezable bottles are an easy way to prevent cross-contamination. Buy ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise in squeezable bottles, and don't allow their tips to come into contact with gluten-containing foods. Have a dedicated container labeled gluten-free for butter, margarine, peanut butter jam, and don't double dip. And for cleanup, use separate towels, especially if there are small children in the home who may use a towel for gluten-containing spills and then clean up or wipe their faces and hands off with that or use paper towels to safely wipe up and clean gluten-containing spills. And lastly, these are my gluten-free resources. There are some food and symptom apps, Eat Gluten-Free, which goes into products, recipes, and companies, Find Me Gluten-Free, which is a free gluten-free dining app, Spoonful, which has free and pay options for gluten-free products, and the Gluten-Free Scanner, also free, which you can take into the supermarket. These websites are reputable sources of information about celiac disease and gluten intolerance and wheat allergy. Beyond Celiac, the Celiac Disease Foundation, the Gluten Intolerance Group, and the National Celiac Association. And then in addition, there are some prepared meal delivery services that we know are certified gluten-free, and these include Epicured and Modified Health. And now I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Sandra. Absolutely. Thank you, Cheryl, for all this information. It was very, very comprehensive. And yes, we have two questions from our participants. Is duodenitis a symptom of celiac or a gluten intolerance? Um, so duodenitis is an infection of the duodenum, and that's something that your gastroenterologist needs to rule out. So if you have an inflammation in your duodenum, again, like I said, you need to be on a gluten-containing diet. Your doctor would want to do a celiac panel, and then he would want to do a biopsy to really see what's going on there. And then if you can rule out celiac, it might be a symptom of the gluten intolerance. Mm -hmm. Are uh, the bumps of the age usually skin colored? No, they're usually red. They're small little um, itchy, scaly things, and they are incredibly painful and very itchy. Mm -hmm. um, it's and, and they're painful. I didn't know they were very painful. Um, oh, itchy, I knew. Yeah, no, incredibly painful and itchy. It's it's not a fun um, it's not a fun condition, and I've seen it in clinic, and people are really very unhappy with it. Mm -hmm. But once oh. starting the gluten-free diet, it really does make a difference for them. Um, some of the medications they use are something called Dapsone. It's also helpful for relieving that itchiness while you wait for your skin to heal. And here is another comment slash question. I didn't know they made flour out of tapioca and yuca or cassava. It sounds delicious. I can't remember if you said whether they 
these are gluten free or not. So you'll see something like tapioca starch or cassava starch, and that's usually what the flour is. They call it the starch. Um, Bob's Red Mill has a big selection of these alternative grains, and most of them are labeled gluten free, but that's important to know because in the manufacturing process, you want to make sure that they're processed on separate equipment, that they're not sharing, they're not using the equipment for something that they processed a wheat containing or barley containing or rye con or containing item, and then used it for these alternative grains. And also, Sherry, you were talking about all these uh, testing that needs to be done. You need to go to the GI first, you have to have an endoscopy, then a lot of blood work. It sounded to me like it's- It's, it's just one fun. panel. <laughs> oh, okay, good. It's just um, one panel. Is this covered by insurance? Usually, yes. Okay. It's a medical condition. Okay, perfect. Now, um, you also, were, in the beginning of your presentation, when you were talking, you were saying, you know, some people can be diagnosed very early in life, and then you have some patients that were diagnosed in their 80s or something like that. So how does the, the disease develop? Is, is this something you're born with and, you know, it gets worse over time or is something that be, can be developed like overnight? Like, how do you know? Because, you know, for example, I know people that might have some GI issues. They go to the doctor and appears that it's nothing, but they continue having the GI issues. Could it be that later on, uh, you know, it becomes more apparent or... Yeah. So celiac disease is an autoimmune condition, just like type one diabetes, just like lupus, just like Hashimoto's, you know, thyroid disease. In celiac disease, um, we um, actually know that there is a gene that is triggered. And when that gene is triggered, the celiac disease turns on. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of hypotheses as to what could be triggering that gene to turn on. There could be an infection. There could be an environmental change. There could be a change in the diet. We don't know what triggers that gene to turn on. Oh. You know, it's the same thing with like type one diabetes. You have the gene, you know, we don't know if there's a gene, but we don't know what causes it, but we don't know why all of a sudden does somebody develop type one diabetes? We don't know. So for somebody with celiac disease, it goes undiagnosed for so often because people aren't being tested for it. And like I said, it's a simple blood test. That's the first thing you want to do. And if the blood test comes back negative, then in all likelihood, you do not have celiac disease. But again, you need to be consuming gluten. And for a lot of people, they're like, I don't want to be doing that because it's very onerous. I don't feel well when I'm eating gluten. But it's important to know if you have celiac, because if you're going to be going on a gluten-free diet and a strict gluten-free diet, you want to know that you really have this disease. So there are three things. There's this environmental trigger. There's something that triggers the disease. You need to have the gene. If you don't have the celiac disease gene, you're not going to be triggered and you need to be eating gluten. So for those three things, that's when celiac disease will develop. If you stay on a strict gluten-free diet your entire life, your chances of developing celiac disease are very low. But is that something that, you know, A, it's very expensive, these gluten-free products. They're much more expensive than regular, you know, supermarket items, and they're not as healthy. So it's not a diet that you want to be following in a very strict sense, unless you really know if you have the disease. Okay. And there's no reason to know why somebody develops, we don't know why somebody develops it at four and somebody develops it at 60. And those GI symptoms that you're talking about, they could have for years and they could not be celiac, but then all of a sudden something happens and the gene triggers. Yeah, and actually uh, this discussion goes very well with the next question, which is what are a few of the effects, and I guess you just mentioned some, of following a gluten-free diet when you don't have celiac disease or gluten sensitivity? So uh, most importantly, a lot of these gluten-free products, especially the breads, are very low in fiber. And fiber we know is really important. Fiber helps with weight control. It helps with um, blood sugar control. It helps with lowering cholesterol levels. It helps with healthy digestion. So you wanna be able to eat as much fiber as possible. 
Um, the other thing that happens is those B vitamins that are fortified in a lot of those gluten containing products, you're not going to get by following the gluten free diet unless you're very mindful of making sure that you're getting these alternative grains that I went through that have all those B vitamins. Um, and the last thing is, you know, there's extra sugar and star extra sugar and fat in a lot of these gluten containing items. So if you're really to compare the gluten-free bread versus another bread, you're going to see more. And there's studies that have shun, done to validate this extra sugar, salt, and fat. Because we know as dietitians, when you take something out, you got to replace it with something else to get people to enjoy it. And those things are usually sugar, salt, and fat. Yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, I laugh all the time because... I, I always read labels. It's it's by default as dietitians, we always do is we're maniatic of that, right? So yes. I'm I'm always looking at the gluten-free products and something that is believed not to be so healthy and the not so healthy product is always healthier than the gluten-free. Or not always, but you know, it's often the case. And I just laugh about that. Yeah, you're you're correct. Okay. Um, we have one more minute and Sherry, there are some people that are asking how they can get in contact with you. You know what? I forgot to put my contact information down. Um, you can reach me, um, at Sherry at keatsnutrition.com. Uh, let me, like, do you want me like to your last name, right? I think everybody's looking at that. So Sherry at keatsnutrition.com. I also have a website called I, mean, I, I can't believe I didn't put that was the one thing I forgot <laughs> www.keatsnutrition.com let me just put something in the in the chat yeah well um really this was great I think that a lot of us have learned a lot um you know time to try new things or at least new things to talk to our GI and kind of put it in the mind of Dr. Sherry and I had a conversation before this and we were saying how sometimes you know, you have to bring up things to your GI and say, hey, can I get tested for this? Because by default, they don't always look into these uh, weird uh, diseases. I'm a big believer in being an advocate for your own health care. I think that's really important. And especially outside of New York City, there are some dedicated celiac disease centers. We're very lucky to be very close to New York City. It's where I did my training at the Celiac Disease Center at Columbia University Medical Center. But when you, as you start heading further north, I deal with clients, you know, in the Syracuse area, there's very little understanding and you might not have people who look at it as their first, you know, question to ask, could this be something? And I have to say, it's really a specialty. I said in the beginning, I'm a registered dietitian and you are the specialist. I, <laughs> I don't ask me about these, please. <laughs> I will refer everybody to you, Sherry. Thank you so much to you for this great presentation and to all of our participants. If you found this information valuable, please share it with your friends, with your family, with somebody that you think you might need. And I will be sending the link to the recording so that you can keep um, you know, sharing the information. Sherry, thank you for sharing so thank much. You, and uh, I will see you soon. All yes. of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.